this the last one? Before? No, there will be one more um, next week. Mm. So, um, because of my confusion, <laughs> but, uh, two lots of confusion. One is, although on the posters you've got yes. David killing Goliath, we wouldn't actually get to that point mm. uh, before till after Easter. And also, I put on the newsletter that today we'd start on David, but I'm ahead of myself. That won't be till next week mm. that we meet him, so we're still mopping up Saul. <laughs> 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy Holy Word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, if you remember last week, Samuel very reluctantly uh, anointed Saul as king of Israel and made it quite clear to him uh, that he was to do everything that he was told by Samuel at all times. Um, and uh, uh, Saul initially didn't seem to make a great impression as king on everybody, but then um, he socked it to the Philistines and... Uh, Therefore, they renewed the kingship and he's firmly established um, uh, and, uh, at Gilgal. But Samuel, um, perhaps on the same occasion, thinks that uh, you know, having renewed the kingship and everybody acclaimed Saul as a king, this would be a good time to tell them why having a king is a really bad idea. And so uh, he makes a speech about that. And Samuel said to all Israel, look! I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have set a king over you. And so now the king walks before you, and I have grown old and grey, and my sons, they are, all, they are here with you. And I have walked before you from my youth till this day. If you remember the problem with um, Samuel's sons, is that uh, uh, they're no good, they're corrupt, um, they take bribes, they twist justice, uh, and their names are Joel and Abijah, and some rabbinic readings uh, extraordinarily say that Joel is the one who later on becomes the prophet Joel and mends his ways, um, because of the principle when they read the Bible that they like to make everything as simple as possible, so if you can identify one character with another, then you make it all easier to understand. Um, but Samuel is kind of giving his, um, his valedictory speech now. He's saying, look, I've judged you and I've been absolutely brilliant, frankly, and now you're going to have a king and it's going to be rubbish. Um, yeah. And so he's going to tell them where else. And what he does is he kind of sets up a false argument. He, he imagines that he's on, a, in, in, on, a, on trial with the people of Israel on the other side, accusing him, and he, he exonerates himself, and they're compelled to exonerate him, even though nobody's actually made these charges against him. So he says, witness before me, against me before the Lord, and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? And whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I wronged? And whom have I abused? And from whose hand have I taken a bribe to avert my eyes from him? I shall return it to you. So he challenges them and said, come on, come on, you got something against me, bring it out. I'll, I'll give it back. And they said, you have not wronged us, and you have not abused us, and you have not taken a thing from any man. And he said to them, the Lord is witnessed against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found a thing in my hand. And they said, he is witness. And Samuel said to the people, witness is the Lord who anointed, who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought up your fathers from the land of Egypt. So now he's going to do another rehearsal of the whole history and remind them how faithless they've been and how faithful God has been and how faithful Samuel has been incidentally as well. Um, and now stand forth that I may seek judgment with you before the Lord. 
and I shall tell you all the Lord's bounties that he did for you and for your fathers. When Jacob came into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, and they brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. And they forgot the Lord your God, and he delivered them into the hand of Sisera, commander of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. So we're being reminded of all the horrors of the book of Judges. Sisera, if you remember, is um, the commander of the army whom Jael um, uh, kills by um, namely uh, slamming a tent peg through his temple. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have offended, for we have abandoned the Lord, and served the Balaam and the Ashtaroth. And now rescue us from the hand of our enemies, and we shall serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam, and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and he rescued you from the hand of your enemies all around, and you dwelled in safety. So Jeroboam is the other name for Gideon. Bedan, B-E-D-A-N, something we never met before and never meet again. But then again, the book of Judges doesn't purport to list all the judges. This is one who doesn't otherwise make it into scripture. I think it's quite a good sort of little indication of the authenticity of this text, that if you were, you know, if you were trying to um, make it all fit together, you wouldn't mention somebody that we've never met before here. And indeed, we'll see a bit later on that um, we meet somebody without a proper introduction. Also, I think, um, you know, Samuel is very much in, in tune with the Deuteronomic view of things, um, but he, um, he also stands out from um, some of the later history of this book in that he's, he's so much against kings. And you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, had come against you. He's the one that Samuel, uh, rather Saul, has just defeated. And you said to me, no! A king shall reign over us, though the Lord your God was your king. So he can't let it rest, really. I just want to mention again that, he, you know, this was really bad. And now here is the king you have chosen, for whom you asked. And here the Lord has put over you a king. If you fear the Lord and serve him and heed his voice and rebel not against the Lord's words, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, he will rescue you. But if you heed not the voice of the Lord, and if you rebel against the Lord's words, the hand of the Lord will be against you and against your king to destroy you. Even now, take your stance and see this great thing that the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? Um, why is he saying that? Well, the point is that it's the early summer when habitually in Israel oh, there's no rain. I shall call unto the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, and mark and see that the evil you have done in the eye is great in the eyes of the Lord, to ask for yourselves a king. And Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain on that day, and all the people feared the Lord greatly, and they feared Samuel as well. Uh, I think Samuel would be quite pleased about that. Um, so, even though God has told him to anoint Saul as king, according to the text, nevertheless, he's not pleased that they asked him in the first place. And all the people said to Samuel, Intercede on behalf of your servants with the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to our offences an evil thing to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Fear not, you have done all this evil, but swerve not from following the Lord, and serve the Lord with all your heart, and swerve not after mere emptiness that will not avail or rescue, for they are mere emptiness. For the Lord will not desert his people for the sake of his great name, as the Lord has undertaken to make you his people. So two, I suppose, points for our own lives there. 
even when we get it drastically wrong, the Lord will kind of straighten it out and use even the bad choices we've made if we turn back to him and he'll, he'll as it were, put them right and he'll make them retrospectively right for us. And he'll do that because he's put his name on us. It's one of the arguments that Moses uses when he's kind of challenging God. He said, okay, if you destroy them, everyone will say that, you know, that you're the loser because they're your people and everyone knows it. Um, and so God's kind of pledged himself to defend and protect us. I, on my part too, far be it from me to offend the Lord by ceasing to intercede on your behalf. I shall instruct you in the good and straight way. Only fear the Lord and serve him truly with all your heart, for see the great things he has done for you. And if indeed you do evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Uh, he doesn't deign to mention the king by name, but there's the king standing there, just having been anointed again, and, and he's kind of saying, and when he gets it wrong and you get it wrong, you're in trouble. Um, it's um, it's quite a bold thing to do, effectively, at the coronation banquet, isn't it? <laughs> now, chapter 13 begins with um, a missing bit of text that nobody can work out how to fill up. Saul was question mark years old when he became king, and question mark two years he reigned over Israel. So we don't know quite how old he was and quite how long his reign was. Um, does that matter? Well, not really, because we're not saved by the... Uh, the knowledge of the historical facts. Don't tell that to my students at Oscar. Um, <laughs> but um, we're saved actually by, uh, by the, the, uh, the typological and, and spiritual meaning of these passages. And Saul chose for himself 3,000 from Israel, and 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash and in the Bethel High Country, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gebiath Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent away, each man to his tent. Who's Jonathan? Well, we know, if we've read, the re we've read on, that he's Saul's son, but he just appears. Um, you know, maybe there was uh, some uh, missing uh, text that kind of introduced Jonathan. We don't know how old he is. Uh, clearly, Saul, when we saw him before becoming king, was a young man. Um, you know, he was the, the ignorant farm boy out hunting for the donkeys and not knowing where to find them. Um, and now suddenly, you know, there's been a great gap and he's, he's had time to have uh, a grown-up son and um, uh, uh, things have moved on. But remember, one of the things that's going to happen if you have a king, he'll take all your sons to be his soldiers and servants and this is exactly what has happened. And Jonathan struck down the Philistine prefect who was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear! So um, this is the shofar, the great uh, horns that uh, are still uh, used by the Jewish people, for example, on the Day of Atonement. And it's, you know, signal, everyone rally, we're going to... Um, not so much fight against the Philistines, really throw off the Philistine yoke, because um, it may be that Saul was in some ways a kind of client king, you know, the prefect, the Philistine prefect was the one really in charge. But Jonathan is having none of it, and he, um, he is obviously very valiant. And all Israel heard, saying, Saul has struck down the Philistine prefect. Well, we know that's not true. It's Jonathan that struck down the Philistine prefect. But maybe um, Saul doesn't like other people taking um, the credit for the things that they've done. Uh, he likes to take the credit himself. And indeed, later on, what turns him against David is when they sing, the women sing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul said, I'm the king! I must have killed more than him! Um, and so... This doesn't happen then. Saul has struck down, struck down the Philistine prefect, and indeed Israel has become repugnant to the Philistines. And the people rallied round Saul at Gilgal, and the Philistines had assembled to do battle against Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen 
and troops multitudinous as the sand on the shore of the sea. And they came up and encamped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. And the men of Israel saw that they were in straits, for the troops were hard pressed, and the troops hid in caves, and among thorns, and among rocks, and in dugouts, and in pits. So what you have here is a conflict between a very technologically advanced Philistine army with its chariots and, as we'll see, you know, all kinds of uh, advanced metal here. And um, the Israelites, on the other hand, are the kind of the mountain men, you know, hiding in the caves and so on. So they perhaps have um, the advantage of knowing the terrain and, and of surprise sometimes, but they don't have the, uh, the firepower. And the Hebrews had crossed the Jordan into the ten territory of Gad and Gilead, while Saul, Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the troops were trembling behind him. And he waited seven days for the fixed time Samuel had set. And Samuel did not come, and the troops began to slip away from him. This is a strange thing again. What time had Samuel set? We don't know about this. Except way back when he just made Saul king, he said, you've got to wait for me until I come. And it's almost as though, you know, this may be 20 years later is the time. Got to wait for Samuel to come, but they're losing heart and the troops are slipping away from Saul. So what does Saul do? He panics. And Saul said, bring forth to me the burnt offering and the well-being sacrifice, and he offered up the burnt offering. And it happened, as he finished offering the burnt offering, that, look, Samuel was coming. Robert Helter has a typically amusing um, uh, comment on this. He says, the timing gives the distinct appearance of a cat and mouse game played by Samuel, he is not absolutely late, but he has waited till the last possible moment, sometime well into the seventh day, or it might even be the eighth day, by which time Saul had been obliged to take matters into his own hands. I think we all know people who arrive so late, and even though it's not actually late, but you don't think they're going to come. Um, and this is what Samuel does. It's almost though he forces Saul uh, to make this big mistake, Saul offers the sacrifice that Samuel should have offered. What we know of Samuel, he's not going to be pleased. And Saul went out toward him to greet him, and Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, For I saw that the troops were slipping away from me, and you on your part had not come at the fixed time, and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, and I thought, now the Philistines will come down on me at Gilgal without me having entreated the Lord's favour. And I took hold of myself and offered up the burnt offering. I have a certain sympathy for Saul. You know, he kind of, he panics. And of course, it's a lack of faith ultimately in God. But, um, you know, and his real mistake is he's always following his own way is rather than simply doing what the Lord through Samuel tells him, um, he thinks, I've got to solve, you know, he depends upon himself and not on God's power. Certainly, that's how Samuel sees it. And Samuel said to Saul, you have played the fool. Had you but kept the command of the Lord your God that he commended to you, now the Lord would have made your kingdom over Israel unshaken forever. But now your kingdom will not stand. The Lord has already sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him prince to his people. For you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. This is the first reference that we have directly to David. Even though we don't know who he is yet, Samuel doesn't know who he is yet. Samuel might actually be bluffing a bit, I think. He says, well, it's all right, because there's already another king, actually. <laughs> um, 
And he's a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> That's the first description of David, and it's, it's key to understanding David. Even when he sins, and sins grievously, he remains a man after God's own heart. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeath Benjamin. So Samuel just storms off now. And Saul mustered the troops remaining with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the troops remaining with them were staying at Gibeah Benjamin, and the Philistines had encamped at Michmash. And a raiding party sallied forth from the Philistine camp into, in three columns. One column turned toward the road to Ophrah in the Shuel region, and one column turned toward the road to Beth Horon, and one column turned toward the border that looks out over the Zeboim Valley towards the desert. And no smith could be found in all the land of Israel, for the Philistines had said, lest the Hebrews make sword or spear. So this shows us that you know the Philistines are the dominant people, and rather like we, we don't allow North Korea to have nuclear weapons if we can help it, they say, we're not going to let the Hebrews do their own metal work, because they might make weapons, will control the supply of metal. And all Israel could, would go down to the Philistines for every man to put an edge on his plowshare and his mattock and his axe and his sickle. So they do have some metals. It's the beginning of the Bronze Age and they're not completely behind the times, but they don't have access to military technology. They have to go to the Philistines every time they want their plows sharpened and so on. And the price of the sharpening was a pin for the plowshares and the mattocks and the three-pronged forks and the axes and for setting the goads. How much is a pin, I hear you ask? Um, it only occurs once in the Bible. <laughs> However, archaeologists have found a pin. <laughs> they found a weight marked pin which is two-thirds of a shekel. <laughs> so there you are. Now you know how much a pin is. And so it was on the day of battle that no sword or no spear was found in the hands of all the troops who were with Saul and Jonathan, but in the hands of Saul and Jonathan his son. So only the king and his son have swords. The rest of them have just got forks and uh, you know, plowshares and axes. And the Philistine garrison sallied forth to the pass of Michmash. And when the day came round, Jonathan, son of Saul, ah, oh, that's who he is, said to the lad, bearing his armour, Come, let us cross over to the Philistine garrison, which is on the other side there. But his father, he did not tell. This is the first indication that we have, which is going to be magnified, that there's a sort of tension and distrust between Saul and Jonathan. They, they're not open with each other. Um, why doesn't Jonathan tell his father? Well, perhaps he wants to be the daring do hero and he knows that dad will say no. And Saul was sitting at the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree, which is at Micron, and the troops were there with him, about 600 men. Given that they're fighting the battle of their lives, <laughs> Again, Saul, you know, lounging under the pomegranate tree, um, doesn't sound like brilliant leadership, does it? <laughs> and Abijah, son of Ahitub, brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, priest of the Lord at Shiloh, was bearer of the ephod, and the troops did not know that Jonathan had gone. So here's another black mark in uh, Saul's book. Who is his priest, his high priest? Um, he's descended from Eli, and Eli's two wicked sons, um, Hophni and Phinehas, and he is descended from Phinehas, and his, um, Phinehas had, a, had, well, we know of two sons, Ahitub, and that's um, who um, Ahijah is descended from, and Ichabod, if you remember, was the one who uh, um, was born at the moment after Eli fell backwards off his chair and the, um, the daughter-in-law of, uh, of Eli, the wife of Phinehas, hearing of Eli's death, 
of the death of her husband and the capture of the ark said, the glory has been exiled, which is Ichabod. Um, great name. <laughs> um, I don't, I've never met anyone called Ichabod. <laughs> be a, a, an unpleasant name to it. It's a sort of, a, there's a, 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 there was a sort of play I went to see at the um, Theatre Royal last year, kind of um, gothic horror with somebody called Ichabod Crane in it. I can't remember what the name of the play, what the play was, but anyway, this man is the high priest and that's a, a bad sign. And in the pass through which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other Senna. The one crag loomed to the north facing Michmash, and the other to the south facing Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the lad bearing his armour, Come, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will act for us, for nothing holds the Lord back from rescue, whether by many or by few. So I think we've got a good impression of uh, Jonathan. He's not only brave and valiant, but, you know, he's really got it in for the Philistines. And he says, well, you know, it's just you and me, but the Lord can do anything. And so he has a great faith. And indeed, later on, he will show his faith not only to the Lord, but his faithfulness to his friendship with David, which he, he prefers even to uh, loyalty to his father. And he defends David and he protects David and he hides David. And um, St. Aylred and his great book on spiritual friendship holds up the friendship of David and Jonathan as uh, one which is uh, exemplary. And the armour bearer said to him, do whatever your heart inclines, here I am with you, my heart is yours. Jonathan is clearly a person who inspires loyalty, <coughs> who, um, you know, his armour bearer um, might well say, well, you're on your own, mate, then. Uh, but he says, I'm with you. And Jonathan said, look, we are about to cross over to the men and we shall be exposed to them. If thus they say, stand till we get to you, we shall stand where we are and not go up to them. And if thus they say, come up to us, we shall go up for the Lord will have given them in our hand. And that will be the sign for us. So Jonathan interprets what happens as, as a sign from the Lord. And the two of them were exposed to the Philistine garrison. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've been hiding. Uh, it's a very contemptuous way of, you know, they're like vermin coming out of their holes. And the men of the garrison spoke out to Jonathan and his armour-bearer, and said, Come up to us, and we'll teach you something. And Jonathan said to his armour-bearer, Come up behind me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees, with his armour-bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armour-bearer, finishing them off behind him. So, it's not quite clear what happens, but clearly he manages, despite the fact that they've seen him, he manages to get to them and to, uh, to ambush them, even though there are so many of, of them and so few of, of him and his armour-bearer. And the first toll of dead that Jonathan and his armour-bearer struck down was about 20 men with arrows and rocks of the field. It's like a prelude to what Jonathan's friend will do with Goliath. The garrison and the raiding party were also shaken, and the earth trembled, and it became dire terror. And the lookouts attached to Saul at Gibeah Benjamin saw, and look, the multitude was melting away and going off yonder. So Saul is sitting there under his trees, <laughs> and then they look out and they say, oh, it looks like the Philistines are running away, even though we're just sitting here. Um, what's going on? And Saul said to the troops who were with him, Call the roll, pray, and see who has gone from us. So he says, oh, um, some, of, some of us fighting. Uh, call the register and we'll see who's not here. Um, it's, you know, Saul is a bit hapless, you know. When we first met him when he couldn't find the donkeys and he, then he was hiding under the luggage and now he doesn't even know that his own son is missing, you know. He, doesn't, he has to have a register call before he notices. And they call the roll and look, Jonathan and his armour-bearer were absent. 
And Saul said to Ahijah, bring forth the ephod. So remember, the ephod is a way of finding out uh, in a binary way um, what God says or what has happened, sometimes of um, who's guilty of something. This must be simultaneous. So once they've caught the roll, Saul doesn't need to know who's missing. For on that day he was bearing the ephod before the Israelites, and it happened that as Saul was speaking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp was growing greater and greater, and Saul said to the priest, pull back your hand. So if Saul has asked the high priest, find out what the Lord wants us to do, but then he sees the tumult in the Philistine camp, he says, oh actually, let's not bother with that. Pull back your hand. Saul always thinks, I know best, I know what to do, I'll make the decision. I was going to ask the Lord, but actually there's no time for that. We'll just get on with it. And Saul and all the troops who were with him rallied and entered into the fighting. And look, every man's sword was against his fellow. A very great panic. And, don't worry about that, a very panic. Um, and there were Hebrews who were previously with the Philistines. So either forced conscripts or those who had just gone over to the other side, who had come up with them into the camp, and they too turned round to be with Israel under Saul and Jonathan. And all the men of Israel who were hiding out in the high country of Ephraim had heard that the Philistines were fleeing, and they too gave chase after them in the fighting. And the Lord delivered Israel on that day. So there's another great victory. Now it's going to go a bit wrong. And the fighting moved on past Beth Avon, and the men of Israel were hard pressed on that day. And Saul made the troops take an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until evening, until I take vengeance upon my enemies. So this is an oath that Saul caused to be taken of his own volition. He's not told to do this by God, but he kind of thinks, oh, I know we'll sort of bribe the Lord. If we all fast until the evening, then he'll have to give us the victory. I'm not sure it's very good military strategy um, not to let your troops eat. Uh, I'm no great military expert, but I just have a feeling that's the case. And all the troops tasted no food. And the whole country came into the forest and there was honey on the ground. And the troops entered the forest, and looked, there was a flow of honey, but none touched his hands to his mouth, for the troops feared the vow. But Jonathan had not heard when his father made the troops swear, and he reached with the tip of his staff that was in his hand, and dipped it into the honeycomb, and brought his hand back to his mouth, and his eyes lit up. And the man from the troops spoke up and said, Your father made the troops solemnly swear, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food today. And so the troops were famished. And Jonathan said, My father has stirred up trouble for the land. See, pray, that my eyes have lit up, because I tasted a bit of this honey. How much better still if the troops had really eaten today from the booty of their enemies that they found, for then the toll of Philistines would have been all the greater. So Jonathan doesn't have very much admiration for his father's leadership. And they struck down the Philistines on that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the troops were very famished. And the troops pounced on the booty and took sheep and cattle and calves and slaughtered them on the ground and the troops ate them together with the blood. So it begins with one forbidden eating of honey and the, the day ends with, you know, they're so famished that they do exactly what God doesn't want them to do. They just guzzle up all this food and they eat the blood, which is forbidden. So Saul has really miscalculated. And they told Saul, saying, look, the troops are offending the Lord by eating together with the blood. And he said, you have acted treacherously. Roll a big stone over to me now. And Saul said, spread out among the troops and say to them, every man bring forth to me his ox and his sheep and slaughter them here and eat. And you shall not offend the Lord by eating together with the blood. So if you slaughter them on a stone, the blood can flow away and it will be kosher. 
And all the troops brought forth each man what he had in hand that night, and they slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar he built to the Lord. I think that's going to be another minus point from Samuel. Um, who told you to build an altar to the Lord? That's my job. And Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and despoil them till daybreak, and we shall not leave a man among them. And they said, whatever is good in your eyes, do. And the priest said, let us approach God yonder. And Saul inquired of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them in the hand of Israel? And he did not answer him on that day. So last time he said, oh, stop asking God. And so now God is silent. And in fact, the Lord will be silent towards Saul until the end of his life. Remember how Saul, the day before he dies, he's so desperate, he calls up Samuel from the dead. And Samuel is in no better a mood in the next life than he was <laughs> in this one. Um, and he says, well, you're finished. Um, but why is the Lord silent with Saul? Why does he not answer him? It's because Saul does not listen. Saul is the one who ignores God's commands. And so, you know, if we want the Lord to answer us, we actually have to begin by listening. Then we can answer. And he did not answer him on that day. And Saul said, draw near all your chiefs of the troops, mark and see wherein is the offence today. So he says, ah, it must be because somebody's done something wrong. Let's see who it is. For as the Lord lives who delivers Israel, were it Jonathan my son, he would be doomed to die. And none answered him from all of his troops. <laughs> so he said, oh, really? <laughs> um, well, I don't know who it was, really. Um, no. Um, oh, dear. Saul, not only, you know, no, the fact that nobody tells him means that nobody trusts him, nobody puts their faith in him. They're all on Jonathan's side. And he said to all Israel, you will be on one side, and I am Jonathan, my son, on the other side. And the troops said to Saul, what is good in your eyes? Do. And Saul said, Lord God of Israel, why did you not answer your servant today? If there is guilt in me or in Jonathan, my son, O Lord God of Israel, show Urim. And if it is in your people, Israel, show Thummim. So the Urim and the Thummim are probably like dice or lots in the, in the uh, ephod that the high priest bears. And they give an answer. So that's uh, always how you determine. Um, remember, that's how Saul was chosen as king in the first place. The lot fell upon him and they said, well, where is he? Oh, he's under all those suitcases there. Um, and the lot fell on Jonathan and Saul. And the troops came out clear. And Saul said, cast between me and Jonathan, my son. And the lot fell on Jonathan. And Saul said, tell me, what have you done? And Jonathan told him and said, I indeed tasted from the tip of the staff that was in my hand a bit of honey. Here I am, ready to die. And Saul said, so may God do to me, and even more, for Jonathan is doomed to die. And the troops said to Saul, will Jonathan die, who has performed this great rescue in Israel? Heaven forbid, as the Lord lives, that a single hair of his head should fall to the ground. For with God has he wrought this day. And the troops saved Jonathan, and he did not die. And Saul went away from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went back to their place. I think things have come to a pretty pass when it's Jonathan's father who wants to kill him, and the troops who say no. Um, again, what happens later on makes a bit more sense when we see that story here. And Saul had taken hold of the kingship over Israel, and he did battle round about with all his enemies, with Moab, and with the Ammonites, and with Edom, and with the kings of Zophar, and the Philistines, and wherever he turned he would inflict punishment. And he triumphed and struck down Amalek, and rescued Israel from the hand of its plunderers. And Saul's sons were Jonathan, and Ishvi, and Malkishua, and the names of his two daughters were Merah, 
the firstborn, Merab, the firstborn, and Michal, the younger. Remember those names, we'll meet them later. Um, they want to marry David to Merab, but he says, no, I don't like Merab, I like Michal. <laughs> and uh, she's the one that he does marry. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz. And the name of his commander was Abner, son of Ner, Saul's uncle. And Kish, Saul's father, and Ner, Abner's father, were the sons of Abiel. And the fighting against the Philistines was fierce all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any warrior or valiant fellow, he would gather him to himself. Um, you might ask, why have we suddenly got, you know, in the middle of the narrative, a kind of summary of Saul's life, of who his children were and who his wife was and, and who he fought against? And the answer is, it's almost as though the, uh, the author is saying, OK, we have reached the end of the time of Saul. He's finished. So let's give a summary. And although he is still in name king of Israel, actually Samuel has told him that there is already somebody else who has been chosen. And just as Samuel, Saul began secretly as king before he was publicly acclaimed after the falling of the, uh, the lots, so now he's secretly not king. Only he and Samuel know it, but every authority has drained away from him. When he big, makes a big decision, I'm going to execute Jonathan, the troops say, no, you're not, and it's they who prevail. So, <clears throat> one more chapter and we shall, we shall see Saul's kind of... Uh, downfall completely with Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, me, Samuel likes that word, me has the Lord sent to anoint you as king over his people Israel. And now heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of armies, I have made reckoning of what Amalek did to Israel that he set against him on the way as he was coming up from Egypt. So when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, the Amalekites um, struck down the stragglers. You know, it was a really cruel, vicious, and, and, and uh, wrong thing to do. And that's why the Lord said then, I will have war with Amalek, Amalek in every generation. Now, go and strike down Amalek and put under the ban everything that he has. You shall not spare him and he shall put to death man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So because Amalek is so immoral, everything of his must be destroyed, put under the ban. And Saul summoned the troops and assembled them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. So he's no longer the rugged mountain commander. He's now got a proper army and, um, you know, they're, they're winning everywhere. And Saul came up to the city of Amalek and lay in wait, in wait in the ravine. And Saul said to the key knight, go turn away, come down upon the midst, amidst the Amalek, lest, Amalekite, lest I sweep you away together with him. So the key knights, um, of course, are, are, are not to be utterly wiped out. Indeed, they're sometimes allied with Israel. For you did kindness to all the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt. Um, the Kenites um, were metalsmiths, and we don't know what kindness they did, but they still remember it. And the Kenite turned away from the midst of Amalek, and Saul struck down Amalek from Havilah till he come to Shur, which is before Egypt. And he caught Agag, king of Amalek, alive. And all the people he put under the ban of the edge of the sword and Saul and the troops with him spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat ones and the young ones, everything good. And they did not want to put them under the ban. But all the vile and worthless possessions, these they put under the ban. So Saul has disobeyed Samuel and he's done it for really base motives. I think we'll keep these. I mean, these are valuable. Um, and he's also, he's not killed Agag. But the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I repent that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from me, and my words he has not fulfilled. That's an echo of in the story of Noah, when God says, I repent that I made humanity. And Samuel was incensed. He's good at that. 
And he cried out to the Lord all night long, saying, Why did you make me make him king? I knew it'd be rubbish. And Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul has gone to Carmel. And look, he has put up a monument for himself. <laughs> so he has put up a, a monument saying, Best king ever, I've really smacked it to the Amalekites. And he has turned around and passed onward and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have fulfilled the word of the Lord. He just makes it worse for himself, <laughs> doesn't he? And Samuel says, said, And what is this sound of sheep in my ears? And the sound of cattle that I hear. And Saul says, oh, From the Amalekite I have caught them, for the troops spared the best of the sheep and the cattle in order to sacrifice to the Lord your God while the rest we put under the ban. So Saul says, Oh, oh those sheep! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, of course we've kept those to give to God. Um, well, there's no indication that that's true, and even if it were, God doesn't want these sheep, he doesn't want these cattle, and he said they were all to be put under the ban. And Samuel said, hold off that I may tell you what the Lord spoke to me this night. And he said, speak. And Samuel said, though you may be small in your own eyes, you are the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord has anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said to you, You shall be put under the ban of the you shall put under the ban the offenders Amalek and do battle against them till you destroy them all. And why did you not heed the voice of the Lord? For you pounced on the booty and did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Samuel is like a kind of really frightening headmaster who says, you've let yourself down, you've let <laughs> Israel down, you've let God down. And Saul said to Samuel, but I heeded the voice of the Lord and went on the way the Lord sent me and I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, but Amalek I put under the ban and the troops took from the booty sheep and cattle, the pick of the ban things, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, Does the Lord take delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in heeding the voice of the Lord? For heeding is better than sacrifice, hearkening than the fat of rams. For the diviner's offence is rebellion, the transgressions of idols defiance. Since you have cast off the word of the Lord, he has cast you aside as king. It's a beautiful um, passage, not beautiful really for Saul, but you know, it, it, it prefigures later, you know, like Psalm uh, 15, <coughs> even in the New Testament. Sacrifice and oblation, I do not want. God wants justice, he wants mercy, he wants compassion. But above all, he wants obedience. He wants us to do what he says. He doesn't want us to um, uh, you know, decide for ourselves how to, how to carry out his will. And Saul said to Samuel, I have offended, for I have transgressed the utterance of the Lord and your word, for I feared the troops and listened to their voice. That's why I feel sorry for Saul. His problem all the way through is being timidity. Um, St. Paul, of course, says to, timid, to Timothy, you know, um, the spirit of the Lord given to you is not a spirit of timidity. Um, and Saul should have put God first, but he was more afraid, you know, to, to be in with the troops. He listens to what they say. They wanted the booty. He let them take it. And therefore, he scuffed his whole vocation. Now, though, Forgive, pray, my offence, and turn back with me, that I may bow down before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not turn back with you, for you have cast aside the word of the Lord, and he has cast you aside from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned round to go. As Saul knows, he will be humiliated if Samuel doesn't come with him to the sacrifice after this victory. Samuel turned round to go, and Saul grasped the skirt of his cloak 
and it tore. Remember the little cloaks that Sammy used to wear when he was a boy, and now he's an old man in a big cloak and the cloak tears. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn away the kingship of Israel from you this day and given it to your fellow man who is better than you. And what's more, Israel's eternal does not deceive and does not repent, for he is no human to repent. And Saul said, I have offended. Now show me honour, pray before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn back with me that I may bow to the Lord your God. So Saul says, yeah, I know I've got it wrong, but could we just save face? Please come with me. And Samuel turned back from Saul, and Saul bowed to the Lord. And Samuel said, bring forth to me Agag, king of Amalek. And Agag went to him with mincing steps. <laughs> and he thought, ah, oh, death's bitterness is turned away. So he thinks, ah, oh, look, this great prophet wants to see me now. I know it's not so bad, is it? And he minces along. And Samuel said, as your sword has bereaved women, more bereaved than all women, your mother. And Samuel cut him apart before the Lord at Gilgal. And Samuel went to Ramah, while Saul went up to his home in Gibeah Saul. And actually, even some of the rabbinic commentators said, Samuel does not enact proper justice. Uh, it would have been better, you know, if Saul had killed uh, Amalek in battle, but, you know, he gives him no hearing, and even though he's obviously annoyed by his mincing about, he just runs him through. And Samuel saw Saul no more until his dying day. For Samuel was grieved about Saul, and the Lord had repented making Saul king over Israel. Again, according to a midrash, the time between um, Amalek being captured and him being killed was obviously a very lax kind of prison condition because during that time he had descendants. And one of those descendants, much, much later, and we're told this in the book of Esther, was Haman, the villain, the one who is pitted against Esther, and Esther is descended from Saul. So what the Jewish people have just been celebrating at Purim is the final victory when Esther and Mordecai, the descendants of Saul, finally put an end to the Amalekites and the descendant of Agag in the person of Haman. And I should say, and it's been pointed out to me, that when I said last week that the book of Esther does not contain the name of God, I meant, of course, the Hebrew book of Esther, whereas the Greek editions which we use in the liturgy, in which the church accepts, do um, uh, contain the word of God. Um, but the, um, the original Hebrew doesn't. So there we are, that's um, all very stirring stuff. Next week, we really will meet the man after God's own heart, David, and we'll see a new beginning, and, and even Samuel will cheer up. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? I was like the version in the King James Bible. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Surely the time of bitterness is yeah, gone. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sure we can all sort this out between friends. <laughs> I told my marmalade one year, Agag, old Agag. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Very cool. I pray thee, loving Jesus, that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee, the fountain of all wisdom, and to appear forever before thy face. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.